Good evening and welcome everybody to this April 8th Dean Lecture Series on Decolonizing and, and Indigenizing Education in Canada. We'll begin today's uh, series with a traditional territory acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Uh, before we begin uh, tonight's lecture, we did want to remind uh, everybody of our next uh, Dean seri Lecture Series uh, with Br Blair Stonechild, Loss of Indigenous Eden, Insights for Educators on May 3rd. So for today, I would like to welcome Dr. Sheila Kotemik and Dr. Timer Morkey Pickering. Dr. Kote Meek is Anishinaabe from the Teme Ogama Anishinaabe. She's the inaugural Vice President of Equity, People and Culture at York University, where she leads a team that includes the Center for Human Rights, Equity and Inclusion, Labor Rights and Human Resources. Prior to this, Dr. Kote Meek was the Associate Vice President, Academic and Indigenous Programs at Laurentian University, where she played a leadership role in advancing Indigenous education. She's the author of Colonized and Classrooms, Racism, Trauma, and Resistance in Post-Secondary Education from 2014. And she has two recent co-edited books, uh, Critical Reflections and Politics on Advancing Women in the Academy. And our highlight for tonight, Decolonizing and Indigenizing Education in Canada. Dr. Kote Meek is well known provincially and nationally for her work in promoting equity and inclusion in higher education. Dr. Timer Morki Pickering is a Maori of the Narti, Pukikor, and Tuhoi tribes. She's a full professor in the School of Indigenous Relations at Laurentian University, where she teaches courses on Indigenous research methodologies, international Indigenous issues, and United Nations and Indigenous social work. She has extensive experience working with international Indigenous communities, evaluative research, big data analysis, and photo voice methodologies. She's also co-editor of the book of tonight's highlight, Decolonizing and Indigenizing Education in Canada. And she's also lead editor for another book, Critical Reflections and Politics for Advancing Women in the Academy. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Shole Sheila Cote Meek and Dr. Timer Morkey Pickering. Miigwech, uh, thank you, uh, Amy, uh, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation um, to be here tonight to uh, give this lecture. I'll start with uh, introducing myself. Bojo, Kwe Kwe, Sema Kwe, Dishnakas, Makwago Dam, Kemiagama, Anishinaabe. Warm greetings to elders, special guests, and attendees. My traditional name is Tobacco Woman. I come from the Bear Clan and from the people of the deep water, the Temiagama and Nishna Bay. I also want to begin by uh, acknowledging that I'm hey currently everyone, on the in today's video, we're going to be of the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendom. I also acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the territory I am on is subject to of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes regions. Uh, we were invited here this evening to speak on the theme of truth and reconciliation within the context of our recent edited book on decolonizing and indigenizing uh, education in Canada. I have to say I'm a little uh, a little nervous tonight, not that I usually get nervous, but um, when I saw the number of people that had signed up uh, to attend the webinar, um, I started to wonder uh, 
you know, what was what was the big attraction. But um, I, I spent some time reviewing and going through uh, the book uh, once again and realized, um, you know, the value uh, of the book itself and the many sharing um, sharing of teachings uh, and learnings and, and experiences that each of the authors contributed. Um, so I'm really pleased that there is, um, you know, a fair, uh, fairly significant group uh, here tonight. So in reflecting on my work and my role in post-secondary education, I've been looking back um, at what has changed and how far we have actually moved the bar with respect to meeting uh, the educational aspirations of Indigenous peoples. As far back as I can remember, Indigenous peoples have been advocating and pressing for changes to mainstream education. I think uh, for me, when I reflect back, one of the most important documents centering the aspirations of First Peoples was, is, the National Indian Brotherhood Assembly of First Nations document that was put out in 1972, uh, Indian Control of Indian Education. Nearly 50 years later, this document still remains foundational in that it continues to express the views of Indigenous peoples and education. Subsequent documents released reaffirmed similar aspirations and, and recommendations that followed. For instance, in, 1990, in the 1990s, saw the release of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, in 1996, which again called for fundamental changes to education for Indigenous people, and that education be viewed as a fundamental element of self-government, and it is still about regaining control and agency over our lives, including education. Another relevant report released in the 1990s was Tradition and Education Towards a, Vision, uh, up, Towards a Vision of the Future, which was released in 1998, and it was also released by the Assembly of First Nations. And, that's the, and this document built on the previous Indian control of Indian education by expanding on the need to have control over our education to describing education as a vehicle that could contribute to a large to our larger struggle for self-government. More recently, the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015 called for, for a change in the fundamental relationship between Canadians, government, and Indigenous peoples. This prompted um, a wave of responses across many educational institutions across Canada to once again relook and re-examine how they were responding or not responding to the educational needs of Indigenous peoples. I start uh, by drawing your attention to these kind of key reports and commissions because I think it's important to context that the struggle to decolonizing education has been ongoing for many, many years. Many people have advocated, protested, written, and talked back at how mainstream educational systems have and continue to fail Indigenous peoples. In reflecting on the TRC report and the 94 calls to action, I asked the questions uh, to myself, what does reconciliation really mean? And how well is reconciliation possible? In earlier talks, I spoke about the difficulty for me to think about reconciliation without thinking about the Bewawin truth. The Bewawin is about speaking your truth from your heart. I question whether everyone has actually heard the truth or whether we have actually been jumping to reconciliation too soon. In a paper written in 2006 with colleagues, Mike Pickering uh, and others, we discussed the notion of quote unquote white amnesia and defined it as a disease actually rooted in racism. And that is a common strategy that is used to ignore the historical and ongoing injustices perpetrated on Indigenous peoples. These learned behaviors and associated attitudes stem from a lack of acceptance and the continued denial among non-Indigenous academics about their potential roles as colonizers and oppressors. White amnesia allows non-Indigenous peoples to continue in their day-to-day -day world without seeing 
or involving themselves in other worldviews that would challenge their understanding of their oppressive practices, end of quote. So truth is acknowledging those injustices, those abuses and genocide, acknowledging and also understanding them very deeply so that one can speak up against them. Understanding, in my view, comes from being open-minded to learning and understanding, but also uh, bringing about change. Many will have heard the quote by Senator or the former Senator Murray St. Clair um, around education in that education is what got us into this mess and the use of education, at least in terms of the residential schools, but education is the key to reconciliation. I do believe this is an important starting point and I believe we also need to understand deeply what colonization is in order to understand decolonization and build reconciliatory relationships. It is important to understand colonization and I have defined it uh, in a previous publication as having four specific dimensions, which I um, reiterate here. Those four dimensions include one, um, of the specific dimensions is that colonization has always been about the land and the resources. Um, and, we, and there's still lots of evidence uh, of that today. Uh, second, in order for colonization to have proceeded, it had to do so with the specific mindset that reduced Indigenous peoples to inferior positions of inferiority. And those that mindset is actually rooted in racism. Third, colonization always proceeds with a lot of violence. And fourth, colonization today remains ongoing. So in my view, decolonization then at the very core must at least at a minimum address these four dimensions. So this book um, adds to the collections of writings of the ongoing struggle to regain control over education. And it is also about some of the successes in decolonizing education. I see this book as an extension of the work that is needed in education and also a reflection of some of the current changes that are happening today. So a few words about the book itself. I want to draw your attention to the cover because sometimes we look at the covers and we see, you know, a really nice photo or a really nice picture, but the the um, the cover of the book is actually a painting that was done by a friend of ours, Patrick Chichu, and it's called Kokum Flowers. And and really, in and of itself, it is a chapter of its own. We met um, Patrick Chichu at Congress in 2019 um, at UBC. He's a talented create artist, and as we talked and got to know each other. Um, we realized that here was a person who was put in our path, who understood the need to decolonize education. And it was at that moment, uh, we, uh, myself and Tyler Moike Pickering, reached out to see whether we could commission him to uh, do a cover for our book. This culminated in his artwork called Kokum's Flowers, which is a tribute to his late Kokum, Loti Bird. The artwork is a beautiful representation that links our work today on decolonization and indigenization with that of our ancestors. So linking the present uh, with the uh, future as well as the past. To quote Patrick, it is my opinion that the methodology be behind art creation travels from generation to generation through hands-on approaches that are accompanied by storytelling and language teachings which is exactly what this book does. It is through our own worldviews that we generate and hold space within post-secondary institutions for the new generations of Indigenous scholars to bring their collective Indigenous knowledges and expand the trail for generations to come." End of quote. Wow, if I were to summarize this collection of writings, there's actually no better description than that. Patrick Chichu effectively captures through his artwork what we often talk about. That is the importance of knowing and linking our ancestral knowledge to the work we do today and ensuring we're laying tracks for the generations to come. 
In the chapters that follow, there is a diversity of experiences and perspectives that make up the collection. I focus my remarks on the first thematic section of the book, including the introduction. Time will focus on the second thematic section. Um, my own introductory chapter speaks to, the, to moving the discussion from colonized classrooms to transformative change in the academy. We can and must do better. Understanding colonization and the impact is imperative. However, we need to think deeply about mobilizing change, but that change needs to be sustained and it needs to be transformative. It requires leaders who are committed to systemic change. I challenge readers as well as uh, members in the audience to think more deeply about the truth, the way we win, and whether we are focused on reconciling action, actions that make institutions and individuals feel good because they have done something. Truth and reconciliation is much more than that. It takes a long-standing and concerted effort to build trust and build relationships that are truly reconciliatory. This means that truths must be acknowledged despite that they may be more difficult to hear and listen to because they are stories about injustices, they are confirmations about abuse, and they are affirmations of genocide. And these injustices, abuses, and genocide remain ongoing. So decolonization requires us to acknowledge and understand these truths deeply. Without this understanding, there is no decolonization. So decolonization is a very complex process and will take time and effort and will need to be systemic in nature as well as transformative. Putting an end to ongoing cult Colonialism means addressing issues relating to the land and resources, addressing the colonial mindset that is rooted in racism, and addressing the violence that Indigenous peoples experience most on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we speak about change, we speak about transformational change. The, the other chapters uh, in the first uh, thematic area focus on Indigenous epistemologies, and we purposefully uh, centered uh, Indigenous knowledges and the chapters uh, relating to Indigenous knowledges uh, right up front in our book, because we believe that centering Indigenous knowledge is a key element of decolonization. So Angelina Weenie's chapter focuses on reclaiming land-based pedagogies, and Patricia McGuire's chapter focuses on Anishinaabe Kwe's role, and they both uh, assert the importance of centering Indigenous knowledges and the importance of understanding our connections uh, and our roles, as well as our relationship to the land. Brianna Scott uh, brings her perspectives on reconciliation and the Métis. Chapters three by Candace Gala and Amanda Holmes, and then chapter four, uh, by a number of authors, including Evelyn Steinhauer, Trudy Cardinal, Mark Higgins, Brooke Maiden, Noella Steinhauer, Patricia Steinhauer, Miss the Underwood, Angela Wolf, and Bob Elder Bob Cardinal provide the examples of decolonizing the academy and drawing on Indigenous knowledges to transform how we think and how we frame and how we explore, for instance, assessment and evaluation. The last chapter in the first thematic area is by Celeste Pedro Spade, and she centers her lived experience as an Indigenous woman um, trans, uh, navigating uh, the academy. In their own unique ways, each of the authors express the need for change and provide us with examples of what is needed and how change can be realized. There is no doubt in my mind that there is much work to do and bringing about systemic transformative change is no easy task. As Weber 2018 notes, no single project, no single program or initiative will do this. This effort is going to take many strategies and many interventions. I'm going to close um, my section with a comment about leaders and leadership, both of which are critical to transforming any system. 
Leaders can become drivers of change or they can be resistors of change. Which are you? How can we disrupt the status quo and mobilize meaningful change that leads to decolonization and reconciliation? We need people to drive that change. Miigwech, merci, thank you. And I'm passing it over to Tana. Kia ora. Wow. Um, Miigwech, Sheila. Wow, that was just amazing. Kia ora and warm greetings. To the First Peoples of Turtle Island, I bring warm greetings from my ancestors to yours. Our shared colonised histories and our future aspirations for the next generations to come. Namahi koutou katoa. Thank you, Amy, for the introduction, Tamara and Dean Renau for this opportunity to be a part of this Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series with the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba and to all of you, all the guests who registered this evening, kia ora, warm welcome. I live in Vaughan, Toronto, and my home is on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. And I think about that often. I think about our relationship with the land. I'm gonna start off my section with reflections on my own decolonization journey. And then I'm gonna talk about the eight remaining chapters in this book. Nearly 30 years ago, I began a journey of learning about colonization and decolonization. It was always tucked away in my heart, but I never had the words, the history or the truth to know what those intergenerational feelings truly meant then. When I took up my responsibility of decolonizing, it followed three pathways. The first pathway was as my uncle John Nangiho a Tuhoi respected scholar and old elder told me was to find out who you are, where you come from, and then you're gonna know where you're going. The gift of this teaching is that the past, present and future are inextricably intertwined in everything we must do. It was him that taught me that it doesn't matter what age you are, the value of reclaiming your knowing is when you're ready to receive it. He also gave me my master's thesis topic, which came to him in a dream. As a young person then, I was not as solidly in touch with my spirituality as I am now. So I took a huge leap of faith and I decided to go with this topic idea, which was about Māori identity. This research took me on a journey of learning about my lands, our territory, my language, what acts were imposed on us and what happened to us during the colonial wars in New Zealand. I learned about my grandparents, their genealogy, and through that journey, I learned truly what it meant to belong to my Māori culture and why picking up this responsibility became a lifelong journey, which I still hold dear to this very day. On reflection, this was the most sacred and special part of my decolonizing journey. The second part was not. My second pathway toward decolonization was via education, university to be exact. 30 years ago, using a Māori thesis methodology or asking for more Māori content in a psychology program was not easy. For the most part, I was viewed as being antagonistic towards Western ways of education. I became a threat, but not fully realizing the full extent of it, as racism then, as it is now, can be very covert and secretive. So it forced me to make a stand, to be a true advocate for Māori education. This meant actively finding ways to learn about what the root causes of racism were and disrupt them. This is the hard and laborious part. Interrupting discrimination, confronting negative stereotypes, engaging in tough conversations is not easy. And I see lots of support and kaha to those of you who are decolonizing every day to charter a better place for indigenous education. 
the price we pay is huge. Missed opportunities for tenure and promotion, inequity and pay parity, working in departments that are not of our trained discipline, being labelled as resistors, asked to sit on countless committees, and sometimes being witness to overt racism from within our educational systems. Yet despite this, we get back up, cleanse our cultural cloaks, and we keep moving forward. I do not feel any guilt for prioritizing anything and everything Indigenous in my scholarship, my teaching, leadership, leadership and research. I am a proud Indigenous academic. Drawing on a quote from Professor, distinguished Professor, Linda Tuhiwai Smith from her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in Indigenous People, she states, our survival, our humanity, our worldview and language, our imagination and spirit, our very place in this world depends on our capacity to act for ourselves, to engage in the world and the actions of our colonizers, to face them head on. I concur. And this is what this amazing 16 chapter collection does. And for me, this is the best and third part of my decolonization journey, when we share strategies amongst wise elders, professors, scholars, communities, families, researchers, friends and allies about how we want Indigenous education to be. A human right that we all deserve. As Sheila intimated earlier, this book is in two parts, and now I will focus on some of the content from the second part of this book. Professor and colleague Lynn Lovely poses this question. Is decolonization possible in the academy? Many Indigenous peoples ponder the same question. How much of our traditional knowledge should be in a system that is not always welcoming? Who are the guardians of that knowledge and how is that knowledge cared for? Indigenous administrators, faculty, students and staff carry the weight and responsibility of indigenizing and decolonizing in the institutes. How are they cared for? What policies are there to protect them as they navigate indigenous knowing and being? For speaking out for indigenous rights, how is their research, teaching evaluations and promotions affected? Is anyone monitoring these? What are the stats saying? Another big question is, if not here, where? As posed by authors Mary Ellen Donnan, Avril Aiken and Jean Manor. The role and input by community leaders is vital, but their leadership and cultural input should be recognized appropriately by all of our institutes. How might we all collaborate to balance cultural intellectualism and educational intellectualism? By the way, you'll have to buy the book to find the answers. I'm simply helping you to envision what is in there or helping your brain and heart vibrate with these stories. The TRC outcomes and the place of reconciliation provides concrete actions for educational institutes. How that is applied, who by and who monitors these actions is a question that authors Emily Grafton, Jerome Melikon and Michelle Kapow ponder in their respective chapters. How do you capture truth and then evaluate it? Is that our role as academics? How do we know when we have reached the community's vision of the TRC in education? How far off or near as academics are we from that vision? How do we ensure that their vision and their hope for better education for their children and the future generations to come are sustainable? Chantal Fiola and Shauna McKinnon share strategies for bringing education to urban communities and urban communities to education. Likewise, Fiona Purden, 
Senja, Styers, and Arlo Kemp talk to teacher education programs as sites of possibility. Imagine that, sites of possibility. As both these chapters espouse, this is an inclusive space of acceptance for respectful transference of knowledges. I think that's really amazing. Please read those chapters. Not all knowledge is theoretical or scientific. Much of our indigenous cultures connect the spirit with the ancestors, bringing our knowledges through art, oral storying, poetry and dreaming. In my culture, our artists are also the visionaries. They see way ahead, way, way ahead. And through their artistry, they show us a way forward. They must also be included in all levels of decolonizing and, and indigenizing. In fact, that is what Kiri Chichu and my chapter talk about. What is the role of indigenous visionaries in education and what might the future of indigenous education look like? We think there should be a more inclusive curriculum revamp that also includes art, oral, technology, dreaming, and safe spaces to know who we are, where we come from, and where we are going. So to conclude, I used this book for two of my classes, a fourth year and a master's class this semester. The main feedback from them was that this book helped them to understand the root causes of systems, how Indigenous academics were claiming spaces in academia, and how to make education more applicable to Indigenous communities. One student shared that the terms decolonizing and indigenizing was super complicated, but that this book gave clear examples and ways about how to begin or how to expand their knowledge and understanding. I was happy that my students found this text enlightening and inspiring, and we hope you will too. Kia ora, miigwech to all the authors who shared their stories, their heart and strategies for Indigenous education. Thank you for joining in. Miigwech, Sheila and Timer. I just wanted to introduce myself <laughs> before we begin some of our Q&A. Uh, so, Buju, I mean Indigenous, Mang Nami Nindudam, Ninduji Abmatung, Ninduja Anamik Wikwed. So I'm Amy Farrell. I am uh, of the Sturgeon clan uh, from Fort Hope, our Abmatung First Nation, uh, but I grew up in Thunder Bay. So I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education here at the University of Manitoba in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning. Um, as we wait for some of our questions coming in. I did have a, a particular question um, for either Sh uh, Sheila or Timer. Um, and the text talks, a, of course, a lot about um, meaningful transformative change and futurisms. And I was actually curious about your own, what your own particular visions of the academy uh, would look like. I can start if you if you like, um, and then maybe Tanya can add on her, her vision. <laughs> but um, I've I've worked um, in post secondary education now I think since 1989, I, and I, I'm probably showing my age. But um, and I grew up in in you know in the 60s, uh, going to elementary school, and it was a really um, it was very challenging, you know. Um, me and my brothers, we faced a lot of racism uh, on bus rides going to school, a lot of uh, harassment and, and violence. So I guess, you know, when I think about educational systems, uh, I think about those kinds of experiences. And I also think, you know, um, how much has changed, but yet how much hasn't changed. And, and I think when I try to envision a future, um, around education, I'm looking for a future that doesn't uh, perpetuate ongoing uh, racism um, against Indigenous peoples. And I also 
uh, imagine a future where Indigenous people see themselves reflected uh, in the institution, um, whether it's uh, their Indigenous worldviews, whether it's um, the content, the examples that are used in classrooms, whether it's the uh, pedagogical approaches, um, and even to the to the whole pieces around the physicality uh, of buildings themselves. You know, um, do Indigenous peoples feel a degree of comfort? Do they feel uh, included? Do they feel like a sense of community and belonging um, when they step into uh, institutions? And until that happens, I don't think decolonization you know, we can say we're decolonized, right? So it's going to be kind of taking um, ongoing efforts um, that are sustained. Um, and when I talk about transformative change, I, I talk a little bit about it in the in the chapter in the book. But you know, when I when we talk about transformative change, it means that we're disrupting the system. We're we're talking about big changes to uh, a system that, uh, in and of itself. Uh, perpetuates particular ideologies about uh, Indigenous people. So, um, and that can be threatening and upsetting to, to people. Um, and it does take a while for people to come on board. We are seeing some changes now. Um, in, and I think uh, some of those changes were driven by those earlier reports that I spoke about that date back to 1972. But I think what the TRC did was uh, it, it provided an opportunity for people to respond in, in, in bigger ways. And it was good, it's good to see the kind of the momentum that has happened uh, across the country in terms of change. Now, I think the challenge will be to sustain it. Simon, did you want to add anything? Hi, I'm, I'm trying to um, look after my bandwidth because it'll keep, it's, it's very shaky here as well. Um, in terms of the future, um, it's what I was saying earlier, is that we bring that all together. We're not just about the past, we're about the present and the future. And I think those visionaries uh, that are amongst us um, should come together and start looking uh, ahead, even if it's in the art pieces. Um, I was reminded of a story when my students said, I can't complete the last half of my assignment because my computer is broken. So she said that it's gonna take two weeks for it to be fixed. So I said, oh, well, don't worry about it. Just Put it on a, you know, just write it. And she said, on what? And I said, you know, like pen and paper. And she said, oh, that's how I did everything. Pen and paper, library, reading, books. And I've realised just how different this generation is that um, those things that I um, imagine would be ways to solve things may not that be that easily solved when you've been brought up in a technological world. Um, and um, so, you know, we play a role as bridging the past and the present too, but that also gave me a, a realisation that what is the future for Indigenous education and technology? What's that going to look like? And a lot of our kids these days, especially my own grandnieces and nephews who are like five and six, they know how to work um, apps and programs and they can pick up any phone, whereas it takes me a long time to figure out how to navigate around my Apple phone. You can give them three or four different types of phones and they figure it. I think that it's truly amazing. And I think as Indigenous educators now, we must be thinking about that for the next generation. And that must be inside our curriculums that's to come. That must be inside our research projects to come. Now, I know COVID put us in this place very, very quickly that we all had to learn Zoom or Microsoft or, um, um, you know, to uh, teach and deliver um, in new ways, but we did it. It was 
difficult at first, and I know that there was many glitches and there's lots of anxiety, but I think it's here to stay. And like our ancestors, if they can navigate that great Pacific Ocean, we can navigate this new ocean of technology. And I recommend we get onto it and we get on it quickly. Thank you both so much. I think that does give us quite a lot to certainly think about um, in our own practices, for sure. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, the, the first, um, someone asks, do you think elementary educators will find connections in your book? Oh, Sheila, you're still on mute. Sorry, um, and I started talking and I said some great things, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, yes, I think, you know, um, educators in the K-12 uh, sector would find some value in, in reading the book. I mean, um, in terms of maybe not so much that they could actually take kind of quote unquote lessons and bring them into the K to 12 uh, system. But in terms of their own learning, there's always um, application um, from different um, readings that, that are uh, in the chapter. So for example, there's two kind of auto uh, ethnographic uh, pieces, one by um, Celeste Pedro Spade and another one by um, her name just escaped me and, and I can see her, her chapter and I can see her and she's Carrie Chichu um, and both of their chapters talk talk about um, in a very kind of poetic way about their lived experiences facing racism and so I think in terms of any learning that uh, anybody's doing uh, understanding the impact of of um, of racism and what it does to, to people is really kind of critical in terms of understanding how our pedagogies um, have huge impacts uh, on students in the classroom. So anybody could pick that up and read that and, and learn from it. Uh, the, the other two chapters that come to mind are the two uh, front end chapters by Angelina Weenie and Patricia McGuire. Uh, one who, um, Patricia McGuire talks about the role of um, Indigenous women or Anishinaabeg way. And I think there, there is a lot of teachings that she shared in there about the women's roles. But also Angelina Weenie's uh, chapter on land-based education, very relevant to the K-12 sector. Um, and the other thing, um, even though we had post-secondary in mind while we were while we were putting the book collection together, one of the things that we worked with um, in terms of the um, publisher was uh, developing kind of a glossary of terms. Um, there's a series of questions that are listed at the end of each chapter, which helps um, educators who are use, using the book to have focused discussions. But then there's also additional resources that are listed um, that each of the authors have uh, contributed and shared uh, for the reader. So, yeah, I would think personally think it has a lot of uh, application across the board. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Sheila. And I think um, something important that I, if people aren't um, don't have the text is that um, for each of your chapters, you have these discussion questions that help to target some of the um, ideas within that particular chapter, which um, when I went through it, I found particularly helpful. So um, teachers could use those to help target in some of the discussions that they might want to have with students as well. Uh, we will go on to a next question here. Um, so the qu next question we have is, what are your thoughts on how our own peoples, Indigenous peoples, are colonized within their Indigenous organizations and ways to move beyond and help that process? 
Sheila just gave me that question. <laughs> um, I, I like to always come from a place of creativity, and I always like to come from a place of uh, we know. And um, we not only just know now, but we've known a long time. And we have to take that leap of faith when we get challenged or uh, there is questions about um, our place and space, uh, when we want transformative change, when we want to make change. Um, I saw in the thread questions about power. Who has it? Well, we do. We have it. And we need to build on that power. And we can do that in many, many ways. We can do that as a collective. We can do that um, as writers. We can do that as researchers. Um, and we could do that because we care and that's what we have in common. Um, and we can do it because we care about the future. So um, people say, like, what kind of power can we do to make a system that doesn't want to change change? And some people will say we move around it or through it. And um, there are many universities who have done that. And actually, I'm going to take a page out of Sheila's book. So um, what Sheila did was she initiated um, a plan with the Indigenous students, Indigenous faculty, uh, Indigenous communities, Indigenous educators, and brought them all together in the same space. And of course, there was a hundred ways to decolonize, and there was another million more for indigenizing. But slowly together, they were able to pick out a few more uh, tasks that they can do together. And one of them was to put a building at Laurentian University, which is right here in my background. It's the yellow one behind me. Um, and shout out to my to my university. We're going through such tough times right now, but you know what? We're good people. We're great programs and I have fantastic colleagues um, and uh, we're going to get through this friends and uh, we're going to be amazing you know just my little shout out so um, what Sheila's group did was they they wanted a building and they wanted to bring a space and they had a plan and that plan was 10 years in the making they would meet regularly and they made that plan five years in the making making and then one day they said, five years is too much. It needs to be three years. And the building was built. Now, when they went to cut the ground or, or, or break the ground and to do ceremony with the ground, it was going to be like five o'clock in the morning. Some of the questions were, who's going to wake up that early? And then when we got there at 4.30 and the fire keepers were there and the elders were there, there's hundreds of people there from all parts of Laurentian's communities, the indigenous communities, and it was an amazing sight. So when you build something, they will come. And that's what the elders said. If you wanna make change, build something that comes from your community and they will come. If they see it's got a good purpose and a good vision, they will come. Sheila, you get the next one. <laughs> Thank you, Timer. Um, our, our next one is definitely an, from an educator's perspective. Um, and so this question asks, could you please extend on Indigenous frameworks for assessment? How different from non-Indigenous assessment is it and how can it move decolonization forward in the classroom? Actually, Time is the teacher in the classroom. She's probably better at answering that question than I am um, because I, I'm, I'm the administrator, right? But um, I do want to uh, say a couple of things though about um, assessments um, because there are some, there is a chapter in the book um, that talks about assessment, but I'm also aware of other uh, assessment models um, that are out there. For instance, um, uh, I know that uh, Wilfred Laurier's uh, Master of Indigenous, it's, I don't know the exact name of it, but it's a Master's of Indigenous Social Work, and they use uh, an Indigenous assessment model as well, so that's another example uh, of it. 
Um, and um, but certainly, if if people pick up the book, you'll get some clues about the assessment and the way assessment might look differently. But, but Tanya, do you want to comment on um, how you might look at decolonizing uh, the way that we assess uh, students in the classroom? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, well, there's, you know, like what happens is that we only think there's a few ways, like you, you do an exam, you do an essay, and you write something. And, um, you know, you know, the universe, what we're supposed to do is study the universe part of the university. And how come we're only focusing on three ways to do assessment? And what we need to do is understand what is the universe and what is it telling us about how do we assess? Some of my amazing colleagues at Laurentian, they're doing land-based work. And um, they bring in the elders and the elders help to make that assessment happen. Now, there's no um, one right way, but there is a number of ways. And sometimes an assessment could also be a collective way of assessing. So for me, I try and balance out uh, writing with oral. I try to balance out, um, uh, you know, uh, discussions, uh, I try to balance out being creative, like writing a poem, or um, or for those who who can write essays and they love doing that, then go great ahead. But I was reminded of our, a good friend um, from Australia, um, Professor Bronwyn Carlson, who's um, who said this. She said, "Our people were never taught to write anyway. It's not our culture." And so it kind of like um, helps you to rethink about the way or reimagine what assessments would be. And it takes a lot of courage because a university will say, this is the standard, this is how you have an outco a learning outcome, this is how you're supposed to assess it, this is how they're supposed to reach it. And uh, we underwent a process like that and we were able to negotiate, um, you know, our assessment restructuring and work with our uh, you know, our people um, in admin and just say, this is the way it would work better for Indigenous on this particular topic. And yes, essays work too. And yes, thesis work. And yes, oral works. And I think it's actually a collective um, moving forward. I, I prefer to have students do a range. I like them from writing to reading to being creative to drawing to oral. That's my... Um, 10 cents worth. But um, there's one thing that Sheila said that I think is really important. Many universities are doing this. We're not the first ones to tell you this today. You know, look around, do your research, uh, go study that. There's lots of people doing it. And it's not just Indigenous. You'll be quite amazed at how many people are doing not alternate assessment, because that sounds like it's second rate but other ways to assess fairly. Hope that helps. Miigwech to you both, yes. Um, along the same vein, um, although not necessarily assessment, um, we have a few questions here just around decolonization. Um, so I'll highlight one in particular, um, um, and, and two are very much the same. Uh, one asks how we protect indigenous knowledge in academia, and another here, which is similar, um, how would a decolonized educational system deal with situations where scientific findings and indigenous knowledge conflict? Two, two really different questions, but kind of related. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Way, right? Um, do, we all don't have to agree on it, everything, do we? You know, that's, that's my answer to the second question. <laughs> Nobody said that only, there was only one way to understand the world. Uh, what what um, decolonization is about is acknowledging that Indigenous people's worldview 
uh, is just as valid as any other worldview, uh, because for so long it's been oppressed and not and not uh, viewed as valid. So um, it's okay for us to disagree. We don't have to agree uh, on everything, and and nor do uh, just just to be really clear, time and I don't have all the answers to how decolonization should should or should not happen uh, as well. So. Um, when we put this collection together, it was primarily about trying to bring in a variety of different voices um, around the work um, that's going on around decolonizing and indigenizing uh, education. Um, in terms of protecting uh, Indigenous knowledges um, in, in the academy, because, you know, um, they can be exploited for sure. Um, I think that um, decolonization can't, you know, in terms of Indigenous peoples, cannot happen without Indigenous peoples being involved uh, in the academy. Uh, there needs to be Indigenous scholars that are doing work uh, in the academy, as well as Indigenous uh, staff members supporting work um, in the academy. Um, elders, um, we, you know, we always uh, advocate to have elders or traditional teachers um, working alongside of us uh, in the academy, providing uh, us with uh, advice um, and so forth. And so, um, and community and engaging with community. So having uh, those kinds of important elements um, in, involved in the work um, in a very meaningful way become critically important. So community, uh, elders, um, Indigenous uh, scholars and Indigenous staff need to be involved um, in, in, um, in the academy, whether it's through teaching, uh, whether it's through providing support services. Uh, Tanya, did you want to add anything around those two questions? No, I thought that was actually really brilliant and you covered things I would have said. Um, and I really, I really like that you uh, brought back the community. So a lot of people think education is in the building or in the university or it's in the research centre or wherever. But, you know, Indigenous education is everywhere. It's in our communities. It's from an elder. It's from the young kids. And I think that we, we should also think about that in a, in a bit more broader way um, and think about how we might be more inclusive of, of teachings and, and more inclusive of what we learn. Um, and you would hear, you would hear when you, if you study, and I see them and it makes me really happy, um, the little kids that are learning the language and the indigenous languages and uh, being able to manage like the English language and, and their indigenous language and being able to fit that together so beautifully and moving in and out of, of knowing uh, that, that's quite powerful. And I wouldn't like us to see that being obstructed by the time they get to my level, which is at a university. I would hope that we would continue to allow them to just be amazing and um, and just creative with all that knowledge. Just imagine the university will be having if we allow, when those kids come through with the Indigenous languages, what, what you know, Indigenous education will look like. So, um, miigwech, and uh, thank you for having me on and uh, sharing. Thank you both. Um, there's another question that um, very much leads from what we've just been um, discussing. Um, they ask, what do you see as the most important ways that non-Indigenous staff and faculty can support decolonization and indigenization in universities? I can take this one, um, Sheila. Um, you know what, if you go somewhere new, you will study it, you will learn about it. And that's what we're asking you to do is be part of the heavy lifting. Don't expect us to give you all the answers in five minutes. Go do your research, go read, go study, go talk to other people, watch videos, you know, like be creative and fill your world of, um, you know, indigenous, peoples all over the world because you'll see that uh, there's a lot of the tenets of colonization are similar and the same and don't just stop there go and look at the colonization of the Irish people and the Scottish people 
go look at the colonization of other white peoples and see what happened there. And don't just stop there, go even farther and deeper. And then you'll see that it is our, all of our responsibility to lift racism. It's all of our responsibility to decolonize. Don't just leave it to one groups of people. Um, and we invite you with all your in energy and goodness to help us out, help us to protect something that's really important. But it also helps you uh, when you know your work and you've done your work so that by the time we come to the circle together, it's a conversation. It's not a question and answer period. It's a conversation about what's possible. And I like, there's a chapter in the book about what's possible. So what's next? And the question is, it's what's possible. Miigwech to both of you. I'm looking here for perhaps a, a final last question. And perhaps this is a challenging one. Um, and so this question, um, so they say one of the issues that we see emerge in current university contexts are the creation of indigenous representative bodies chosen from within the university that aren't necessarily representative of local First Nations and Métis governments. Uh, so they ask, to what degree do you think universities are ready to cede power to having Indigenous governments choose who represents them in university governance? So it, if I understand the question right, is, is it around Indigenous Govern, governments choosing who represents them, say, for instance, um, on advisory committees or on the board and so forth? That's what I gather, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's another, um, along the similar lines about working with community, right, um, and being connected to the communities in and around where um, an institution is located, um, and making sure that um, you reach out to those bodies. So, for example, uh, whether it, 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 it could be the local uh, political territorial organization, um, it could be groups like the Native Women's Association. Um, in Northern Ontario was the Ontario Na uh, Native Education Counseling Association. So those, um, if you form relationships with them, then they would be appointing their members to sit on advisory councils that provide advice to the university or to the college and so forth. And so I've already seen some examples of that happening. Um, it doesn't happen at every institution because every uh, institution constructs advisory councils or um, a, a little bit differently, but there is there are some examples where that does happen. And I think it's where it happens and where I've seen it happen is where there is a strong connection to uh, the local um, communities that surround um, or, or um, where the university or the college is located. I think just to summar summarize, I suppose some of some of these concepts is um, definitely what we see from your texts and and you know what you had to say today. It's and you've already mentioned it. There's not one way to go about making these changes within um, you know academia, for instance, or to education in general. Um, and it certainly takes. Um, a lot of voices, Indigenous and non-Indigenous voices, to make these changes in good ways, right? Yeah, and, and know that there are many different ways. And just like there's many different nations of uh, Indigenous peoples across uh, Canada, and we don't all, um, we don't all uh, work in the same ways. Um, although we have some shared values, and we have some shared experiences around, say, for instance, colonization. But certainly in terms of the way that we operate with our governance models, that they might differ. 
Um, and so we wouldn't expect uh, every institution to respond in the same way, for sure. So I think, you know, for me, it's always been important to make those community connections um, and uh, try to work at keeping them strong um, and, um, and being flexible um, and trying to listen to what the community is actually uh, asking for. Anyway, it was a good question. There was actually a lot of good questions that I saw come up in the uh, Q&A and a lot that we couldn't get to, but um, it was great to see all the engagement. So thank you, Amy. Yeah, it was it was hard to try and select select some of them. Oh, we do have had such great responses from everybody. Um, but chi miigwech to Sheila and Timer for your time and your knowledge and your insights and for all of the hard work that you are doing in education to make um, our lives a lot better, I think. Um, uh, so chi miigwech. Um, but I wanted to open and just see if you had any final words before we departed tonight. You're on mute. I just want to say thank you and miigwech to everybody that attended uh, tonight and also uh, for all the great questions, but also uh, Amy for your moderating uh, the questions and for those that invited us from the Faculty of Education, um, miigwech uh, for that. And and I like your, your, your last comment, Amy, about, you know, thanking us for trying to make a better place. And I think you've kind of just hit it uh, on the head. Um, that has always been my passion is to try to build better spaces and places uh, for, for people to be able to participate that have been historically marginalized and oppressed in education. So miigwech for your work as well. And thank you to the organizers for putting this on. And I share the same uh, sentiment. Um, Thank you so much for this opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I, I just wish you, Faculty of Education, and, um, you know, all the work that's going to be going on in the University of Manitoba, all the best and good luck. And, um, yeah, chi miigwech and kia ora tato. So that, that concludes a miigwech again for you both for being here. Uh, and that concludes our session for tonight. Um, and again, thank you for everybody's patience as we were slightly delayed coming in. Um, but uh, please look out if you haven't um, uh, read the text yet. So again, it's Decolonizing and Indigenizing Education in Canada. Um, so please uh, look out for that text, which is available. So thank you and miigwech and be well, everybody.